let's talk about cladistics. A reminder that the ideas covered in classifying using uh, molecular sequences here, these are incredibly important ideas for the ideas associated with cladistics. All right, cladistics is a method of classification which arranges organisms into groups based on their evolutionary relatedness. Now, cladistics uses visual uh, representations of these evolutionary relationships through the creation of cladograms and phylogenetic trees. So we're looking at pictures like this. They're basically providing a best guess for the pathway that organisms have taken um, as they change compared to their shared common ancestor. Now, because we use a variety of evidence to create these images, some of them can be considered contentious, right? Or they can even be disputed. Depending on what evidence is used, they can be created differently. In order for cladistics to be effective, right, as a method of classification, we have to make some assumptions. Now, cladistics relies on these three assumptions to be true, right? The assumption is cladistics is correct because of these things. Now, number one is common ancestry. If life evolved from one single common ancestor, then every combination of organisms shared a common ancestor at some point, right? That makes sense. The second assumption is bifurcation. Right? I'm not very good at pronouncing that. So the idea there is that when offspring change compared to their parents, their characteristics diverge dichotomously, meaning they move in either one of two directions. They will change or they will stay the same as their parents. As an organism evolves away from the point of bifurcation, right, through accrual of these changes, their physical features will become increasingly different to that of their ancestor. And we can understand that idea. So we need to keep these three in mind as we interpret the data in cladograms and phylogenetic trees, which we'll be looking at. All right, phylogenetic trees are similar to that of our family trees. They are branching in pathways that show the descendants of our common ancestors. And we use them to compare species or, you know, genera, uh, phylum, basically any taxa in the Linnaean classification system. Now, they're constructed using homologous features, okay, um, both morphological and molecular. So those physical shapes or those molecular sequences we've spoken about. So they can be built using the DNA or physical features. Each new branch in a phylogenetic tree represents a change in a character trait from a previous ancestor. And this branching is dichotomous. It goes in two possible directions. It either changes from the ancestor or it exists you know, with the same trait. As traits change, we can assume that new species are being formed. Okay, And as more and more changes accumulate in an organism, the evolution of species is occurring. And we'll talk more about that in Unit 4. Now, phylogenetic trees come in many shapes and sizes, okay, and they can be created using diagonal lines, straight lines, or curved lines, uh, but essentially they're showing the same thing, right? And horizontal or vertical, yeah, doesn't matter. So you might just find some easier to follow than others. For example, I really struggle with, say, these ones. Right, phylogenetic trees are either scaled or not. Now, the ones with scales are called phylograms, and the branch length actually indicates the amount of time or genetic changes that have accumulated. So you'll know they are scaled because they provide you with a scale, right? Really simple. It's the amount of evolutionary divergence between the groups or the species or whatever's being compared. Now, those trees without scales are known as cladograms, and the branch lengths of the tree don't really mean anything. Okay, they are not proportional to the amount of evolutionary change. Now you have to be really careful because QCAA seems to use the term cladogram as a bit of a coverall for both cladograms and phylograms. So just keep this in mind. Now phylograms and cladograms can be either rooted or unrooted. Have a giggle. This, you know, the rooted diagrams like this one here um, show all branches coming out of that main branch right there, or the trunk or the base. And this represents the hypothesized common ancestor of all the organisms in the tree. Now, those diagrams which are unrooted, there's no ancestral root shown. And they're usually the diagrams that are circular or radial in layout. Okay, These only indicate the evolutionary relatedness between all the different species uh, rather than from a common ancestor. But both rooted and unrooted tree types can be scaled or unscaled. So really, there's four main types in total. Right, features of a phylogenetic tree. Firstly, we have to look at the root here, and that's showing the common ancestry. Oh, look at that, I already beat the animation. Oh. We have branches, and the lines are representing the hypothesized evolutionary path from that common ancestor. 
we have leaves and that's basically the terminal taxa, the group at the end. So it could be a specific organism with a scientific name. We've got nodes and at that place, this is where the branches diverge. So that bifurcation um, showing the assumed last common ancestor between the two species. We have an outgroup and an outgroup is included, um, but it's less likely to actually be closely related to the rest of them. Um, and it's included to show a common ancestor that is older, um, that's linking all the in-groups. So you can see that the common ancestor for, for say taxon G and all the rest of them is back here. Um, it's also included uh, to give a comparison basically to infer evolution and relationships, um, you know, distantly. Or I think I might've repeated myself, apologies. All right, we have sister taxa here that are shown D, E and F and B and C are also sister taxa and they're basically pairs of groups together that are most closely related, okay, because they have a very close common ancestor there. Now, within a cladogram or a phylogram, each section of the tree is known as a clade and you do need to know how to define this. And a clade indicates an ancestor and all of its, right? all of its descendants. So these are clades because this is where the common ancestor is here and all of its descendants are shown. In this situation, these are not clades because really, if this is the common ancestor, it should include every single thing. If this is the common, an oh, this is a bit tricky. If that's the common ancestor, it should be here or it should be all here. Now, here's an example. We've got multiple nodes, right? To indicate where divergence is happening They're everywhere, basically, if you have a look. It's definitely a rooted tree. You can see that there. Um, it doesn't appear to have any scales, so we know that it is a cladogram. Uh, we can see some sister taxi, taxa, sorry, if we look here, we've got Toxoplasma gondii and we've got Neospora caninum. I can't pronounce that very well, my apologies. Um, we've got ourselves a little out group, which would be all of these. The last known common ancestor would be back here, so it's definitely the out group. And a clade in this diagram would be, say, all of these ones. You know, you could even make it a bit smaller than that if you wanted a smaller clade. Now, in order to interpret cladograms, it's really beneficial to know how they're made. And this is called cladogenesis. And we use a character trait table to start with. Um, you know, so we'll see when we start building them that we are looking at, okay, well, in this particular character, all of the species except this one here um, have that trait. So that will generally be our out group. So the first clade will be the one that has one or none of the listed traits. Now, I'm just going to pop that up on the screen and we can see that, yes, the sea star is the first one there to diverge away. And then we can start looking. We've got a vertebral column here, right? That's the first feature to happen, but it doesn't include the sea star. Then we've got jaws because four out of the six there have it and we can diverge off this organism here. And it continues on like that. It does take a bit of practice to get used to these. Um, and you can make a lot of different configurations using the same data, but the most likely relationship between organisms is actually the simplest one with the least number of evolutionary events in it. Now, the same process can be um, occur, you know, can occur using molecular data, where instead of the simple character traits, we use DNA or RNA or protein sequences to, uh, to create differences between the organisms. Now, depending on where an organism appears in the tree, they will have a unique or a shared related or shared evolutionary pathway, sorry. Um, you know, if we have a look at this here, we've got a unique history of A because this is the common ancestor happening here. But obviously both A and B travel through that pathway before they move out into their unique history. C is the out group because while the common ancestor is back here, it shares no other common features with species A and B. So when we talk about um, relatedness and closeness, you know, is A more closely related to B or C? We can see that A and B have a more recent in time or mutations common ancestor, so they are more closely related. Quite a lot of skills in this unit, so please make sure you are on top of things.